Welcome back to Plenary Session. This is the podcast at the intersection of medicine, oncology, and health policy. Today, I'm going to talk about the CABINET study. It's a study of cabozantinib and neuroendocrine tumor. You may be wondering, if you're watching this on YouTube, why you should listen to a very technical discussion of a cancer clinical trial. This is really about the NIH funding. We're going to come to that at the end. So listen to the discussion, and at the end of it, we'll make it tie together. And if you're listening on the audio feed, this is classic plenary session. So I'm back. Phase three trial cabozantinib to treat advanced neuroendocrine tumors. Of course, I'm Dr. Vinay Prasad. I'm a practicing hematologist oncologist here at UCSF and professor in the Department of Epidemiology. Part one of this is a trial summary. I'm going to walk you through this clinical trial. Part two, I'm going to give you six teaching points, six takeaway lessons from this study. All right. So what is cabinet? Cabinet is 203 adults with extra pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, 95 adults with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, the median age is 60 to 66, and they're getting randomized two to one randomization to sweet, sweet cabozantinib, 60 milligrams. That's a hefty dose. And placebo, matching placebo, 60 milligrams. And of course, there's the two cohorts, the pancreas cohort, and then the extra pancreas cohort. And this is neuroendocrine tumor. Classically, the tumor that Steve Jobs died of. It's not adenocarcinoma. It's a different histology, but it still plays a role in every medical practice. All right, so people always show you table one to show you that this is mostly ECOG zero and one. This is mostly gastrointestinal or lung. If it's extra pancreatic, it's well differentiated. It's grade one and two. The only other thing I'd point out here is that uh, median age is in the mid 60s. Okay. Also table one, this is a key figure. You're gonna see that about 70% of the extra pancreatic nets are getting a somatostatin analog. Only about half of the pancreatic nets are getting that. And the prior therapy leaves something to be wanted. Specifically, 40% had not gotten lutetium dotatate. 20 to 35% had not gotten everolimus. 30 to 60% had not gotten chemotherapy, including one of my all-time most important regimens, cisplatin etoposide, the Charles Motel regimen. All right. The authors give an explanation for why two-to-one randomization in the protocol of their paper. They say, quote, randomization to cabozantinib versus placebo will occur in a two-to-one fashion without crossover from placebo to cabozantinib at the time of disease progression. Crossover will not occur to minimize the chances of an investigator determining disease progression before central radiologic determination of progression in patients receiving placebo who could then cross over to receive cabozantinib. This could lead to informative censoring of data and loss of power to examine the primary endpoint of PFS. Because crossover will not be allowed, patients will be randomized to CABO versus placebo in a two-to-one fashion to increase the odds that they will receive CABO. Patients and investigators will be blinded as to treatment assignment until the final analysis. So here are the key issues. They're going to blind everybody. They're not letting you cross over because their worry is investigators may prematurely declare progression, and that could lead to informative censoring. So those are what they're telling us. And two to one is to make it feel a little bit better. You're twice likely to get CABO than placebo. The trial opens. It opens October 18th, 2020. Sorry, October 2018. And it runs until August 2023. And during these 59 months of enrollment, and actually this data cutoff is from the end date, the sample size of the study is about 300 patients total, which means about five people are enrolled per month over the course of 60 months of enrollment. In November 2020, about halfway through the trial, crossover was permitted. A protocol amendment activated in November 2022, starts 2020, permitted patients who were receiving placebo to cross over to open label CABO after real time central confirmation of progressive disease. Okay, trial dates 59 months enrollments in total, 130 people were enrolled prior to the crossover amendment, and that's 43% of the participants. In May 2023, the Alliance Independent Data and Safety Monitoring Board recommended that the protocol specified interim analysis of progression-free survival be performed with the use of local assessments because there's a lag in the batched assessments of tumors by blinded independent central review. Okay. This happened about 280 patients into the trial. Here's the main result of the study. This is the extra pancreatic net cohort, the pancreatic net cohort, and what you see is there's a progression-free survival benefit, which is the time until... The tumor gets 120% bigger than the starting value if it doesn't shrink or 120% bigger than the nadir value or death, whichever comes first. Interestingly, the trial has no survival gain. If you look at the extra pancreatic net cohort, the overall survival on the right is just stone cold negative, no improvement. And the same thing is true for the pancreatic net cohort, stone cold negative. Toxicity. 
Cabo is a toxic drug. One way they want to show it to you in the abstract is that the treatment-related adverse events of grade three or higher is increased from Cabo to placebo. But to me, for drugs administered daily, grade three toxicity is not a great measure as even low-grade toxicities can become unbearable. Dose reductions and dose discontinuations are better measures of how toxic something is. And dose reductions occurred in 66% of patients on Cabo, only 10% on placebo. The median daily dose administered was 40 milligrams of Cabo, and it was about 60 milligrams of placebo. So you see clearly that Cabo is getting dose reduced way more than placebo. If you look at the list of all the side effects, let me just zoom in on the stuff that tells you you're probably getting Cabo, and that's the diarrhea, the AST, the ALT increase, the hypertension, the oral mucositis, the hand foot syndrome, the anorexia, the changes in taste. That only happens when you're getting Cabo, and that does happen any grade quite a bit, quite a bit. All right, that's the summary of the trial. We have a PFS benefit, no OS benefit, the central review, this crossover, two to one randomization. Let's get into the six teaching points of this study. Number one, is placebo control acceptable? Now, the control arm of a cancer clinical trial should be the best available standard therapy, and placebo control arms are acceptable in oncology in situations where there is no proven nor a well-accepted treatment. That's when placebo is acceptable. Now, there are a few reasons for why for this particular study cabinet, a placebo control arm is not acceptable. Let's run through them. Number one, lutetium dotatate is one of the drugs that a good chunk, I think something like 40% of people in this study had not received. And that was based on this randomized trial called Netter one where there's a PFS and an OS benefit of lutetium dotatate over the control arm. Now, the interesting thing about Netter one is you were allowed to enroll in Netter one if you had previously received tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And in fact, about 16% of people had previously gotten TKI. So Netter one validated lutetium dotatate even after people got TKI. So you would sequence those two agents. Another example is sunitinib. Sunitinib was studied in a randomized control trial of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor exclusively or almost exclusively after people got some chemotherapy. 70% had gotten some chemotherapy. So sunitinib has data post chemotherapy also speaking to the fact that these drugs do have evidence that they are used in sequence. Chemotherapy, of course, is routinely in clinical practices given after lutetium dotatate and tyrosine kinase inhibition. And in 2022, the NCCN, in fact, endorsed that, that you could try Everlimus, or then you could go to chemo, you could try a different chemo. They endorsed these different regimens. Some patients in this clinical trial, in cabinet, actually, when they progressed on placebo, ended up getting those drugs after all. It's shown in the supplementary appendix. There is, in addition to crossover to CABO, which was only allowed midstream, there's cytotoxic therapies given, there's radionucleotide therapy like lutetium dotatate given, and there's VEGF TKIs given. These drugs are given to these people in sequence. So finally, the authors admit that placebo control is not acceptable. Here's what they write in their own paper. Placebo was selected because the efficacy of therapy for patients with advanced neuroendocrine tumors whose disease has progressed after treatment with dotatate or targeted therapy or both has not been well established. They're saying it's not been well established. But they also say placebo was chosen as a control arm because patients could have received all available therapies before enrollment in the trial but these explanations are contradictory. If it is the case that sequencing is not standard practice, then why are doctors sequencing all available therapies in some of these patients? In fact, it is standard practice to sequence these therapies. So that's why placebo control is really not acceptable here because they hadn't gotten all these therapies. It's a problematic control arm, problematic control arm. Placebo control not acceptable in my opinion. Central versus local review. What is going on with this central review, local review? Let's think about it. 60 milligrams of cabozantinib is toxic, and they say dose reductions occurred in 66% of patients with cabo, 10% on placebo. Things like AST and ALT increases, things like changing the way food tastes, these are, these are symptoms you only get if you're getting cabo. The median daily dose of cabo given is lower than the dose of placebo. It's very likely that within five days of taking this pill, everyone knew what they were getting. If they were getting cabo, the doctor knew, the patient knew, and if they were getting sugar pill, they knew because they weren't having those side effects. So imagine you're a doctor seeing a patient who's not having any side effects and they are slowly having their tumor get bigger. Now remember progression is 120% tumor growth in diameter, resist 1.1, but imagine you see them and they're only at 115% or 110% or 117% and you know that you get to decide if they are progressing or not. In your eye, when you measure that scan, what do you think you're gonna see on the scan? This guy has no side effects, it's getting bigger, you know what, it looks like it progressed to me, you might say. Hypothesis, 
Investigators seeing a patient they know are on placebo will be more likely to declare progression, say at 117% or 115%, rather than wait for the 120% resist criteria. But this won't be the case in blinded central review because they won't know that this person was taking placebo. They won't overcall it. So what happens if you look at the investigator assessed PFS on the left and the central assessed PFS on the right, this is both for the extra pancreatic neck cohort as bigger numbers. I'm just doing this for the sake of time. You can see a few things. You can see the number of people at risk below the curve and the number censored. Something happens. At the six month time mark, there are certain number of people censored in one arm, certain number censored in the, in the other analysis, in one arm and the other arm and different analyses. So let's walk through this. According to investigators, among people taking cabozantinib at the first time point, 28 out of 134 people are censored at that first time point, which is 21%, which is actually really, really high, by the way. It's really high. So we can talk more in the erratum, the why it's so high, but 21%. In the central review of cabozantinib at the first time point, 39 people are censored. That's an additional 8.2%, that's 29.1%, a difference of 8.2%. There's 8.2% extra people censored in the central review, the blinded review, rather than the investigators who see whether or not the patient is getting hand foot syndrome. In the control arm, 14 out of 69 patients are censored at the first time point, that's 20%. But in the central review, it's 24 out of 69 patients, which is 35.8%. That's a difference of 14.5% extra people are censored. So 14.5% minus 8.2% is 6.3%, which means central review is censoring an extra 6.3% of patients from the control arm, but not from the treatment arm in time point one in central review rather than investigator review. That's the excess central review censoring. What accounts for that? Why? Why is the central review censoring even more people on the control arm than the experimental arm? Because investigators are declaring progression prematurely. It has to be 110, 115, 170%, not 120%. They're doing that preferentially in the control arm. Why? Because blinding is not being maintained. Ergo, the PFS estimates per their, these own study authors, this is what they write, quote, crossover will not occur to minimize the chance of investigator determining disease progression before central radiology determines progression in patients suspected of receiving placebo. This could lead to informative censoring of data. And that is in fact what is going on in this paper. Both PFS estimates are flawed. The investigator assessment is flawed because it doesn't capture the true moment of progression. They're pulling them off early and it's overcalling at least some patients. And the central assessment is flawed because it censors people preferentially in whom the investigator pulled them off study. And those people might not be the average person in the study. They might be the person who is richer or better connected, more likely to get post-protocol therapy, particularly among the first 130 people before there was crossover because they got to get their therapy off study. So both PFS estimates are unreliable. And this trial is not truly a randomized control trial because you're not following the random groups and you have censoring that's probably not occurring at random. Third point, did crossover mask the survival gain? Some people say there's no survival gain because we allowed crossover, but ultimately only 32 out of 100 control arm patients ever got cabozantinib. Crossover was permitted only for the first half of the trial period, or only second half of the trial period, half of the trial period, and most progressions occur really quickly within three or four months on the control arm. So they're kind of missing their opportunity to cross over if it's happening later in the trial. You put all this together and my guess is that the cumulative treatment time among the crossed over patients is about five to 7%, maybe 10% what the treatment time is among people initially allocated to cabozantinib. And what does that mean? It means that if you use something like a rank preserved structural failure time model, which is a statistical method to correct for crossover, I suspect you probably won't do too much to change these survival curves. Now, I'd love to have the data myself to run that analysis, but something tells me they're not gonna share it and their disease and their data sharing statement says they're not gonna share it, which we'll come back to, at least for one year. Yeah, we'll go ahead and try to get it a year later. Point number four, they used two to one randomization rather than one to one randomization. And they did that because they thought that it would give people twice the shot of getting the drug. Another reason people do that is because they think it'll speed trial accrual. It'll make people more enticed to participate in the study because they know they're twice as likely to get the study drug. But you know, we did an analysis of every single published randomized study on this topic. And we find that actually crossover does not in fact, statistically speed drug uh, uh, enrollment. 
and actually skewed randomization ratio, doesn't do it either. Actually just being a phase three trial and actually being a trial run by Merck. Those are the better predictors of whether or not your trial gonna accrue fast. Merck knows how to put food on the table. They know how to get their trials accrued fast. And that's why they got that blockbuster Pembro minting money out there, okay. Point number five, how should this trial have been designed? What's the better design? In my mind, I do favor one-to-one -one randomization. There's less loss of study power. There's no loss of study power compared to one-to-two or skewed randomization. I think I would enroll all the patients who previously gotten lutetium dotatate. Then I would have randomized to one TKI versus another, Everlimus versus Cabo, uh, or actually an mTOR inhibitor versus a TKI. I would have randomized to one targeted therapy versus another. I would have done it as a superiority study because I think that's more interesting, but I think it would have been fair to do it as a non-inferiority study. Either way, bigger sample size, tight margin. PFS could be the primary endpoint, but I think overall survival should remain an important secondary endpoint, and I don't think you would have allowed crossover. Now, there's another way you could do it entirely. Again, one-to-one -one randomization, you got better power. All patients should get lutetium dotatate, um, TKI, and then you could randomize to chemo or cabo. If you get CABO, then you cross over to chemo. If you get chemo, then I think you'll come off study. Health-related quality of life over the course of the cancer journey could be the primary endpoint. And non-fear overall survival could be the secondary endpoint. This would test the hypothesis of should patients get a trial of CABO before they get the chemo, keep the chemo for the last line, and do they have a better quality of life for the rest of their cancer journey? Perhaps do they even live longer? But I would even accept that even if they didn't live longer, just if they had better quality of life. You could have run it that way. Both of these trials, I think, should have been industry funded. Point number six, this trial wasn't industry funded. It was entirely NIH funded. The taxpayers funded this whole study. And this is an op-ed by Mark Retain, who's a University of Chicago professor. He writes, U.S. taxpayers should stop funding clinical trials of industry-owned drugs. And of course, Cabo is a $26,000 a month medicine. And the makers, Exalexis, they have plenty of money. They can run all the trials that they want. What's my point here? These last few weeks, you've heard a lot of belly aching that if there was any cuts at all to the NIH budget, patients are going to miss out on cures. This is an example of a study that is completely funded with taxpayer money. It's run with taxpayer money through the NIH, and it's pretty unethical. You randomize people who had other treatment options that are normally given in sequence, and you don't give them those proven options. You give them placebo. You measure an endpoint that doesn't really matter, progression-free survival. You don't improve overall survival, even with, I think, not much crossover, you have a lot of side effects that really lead to a spurious progression-free survival benefit because you're having all sorts of people dropping out in both arms. There's massive censoring, and there's even extra censoring on that in the central review because you're pulling people off the placebo arm like they've never seen before. This to me is a problematic study. It's not an informative study. It's not really helping people in the field. It's making a drug company richer. I think this company is gonna use this for marketing approval. It shouldn't be funded by the NIH. So when there are cuts to the NIH, I think we have to admit the NIH funds a lot of things that are not in the public interest and that are not in the interest of the taxpayer. This kind of study should be defunded. And why is the data not available right now? The taxpayers paid for it, but I don't have access to the data. So I can't do all my reanalyses. That to me is unconscionable. These cooperative groups have been hiding data for many years, and that has to change, I think, under Jay Bhattacharya. So to me, it's problematic that this, on top of all the other problems, is NIH funded. Okay, if you like this talk, you know what to do. Subscribe to this channel, comment, leave a message below, follow me on X, but most importantly, if you like this talk, you should be subscribing to the Drug Development Letter. This is developdrugs.com, uh, drugdevletter.com. And we've got 7,000 subscribers. Timothy Olivier and myself run it. It is the go-to stop just for issues of drug development. That's the only thing we talk about on this substack. For everything else, you'll go to my substack, drvaniprasad.com. You can follow me on Instagram. You can follow me on Twitter. You can like, subscribe, and comment on this video, which should be on YouTube and X and the Drug Development Letter. And I'll be back with more videos to come. But this was the Cabinet Study. So classic plenary session for those listening at home. No more complaints, and until next time.